Hello and welcome to HIA. Uh, on May 2nd of 2017, Governor Snyder uh, appointed Marianne Bazze to the Third Circuit Court uh, in Wayne County, which is the largest circuit court in Michigan with 58 judges and three divisions. I am so honored today to uh, interview or to conduct an interview with Judge Mariam Bazze to talk about her success story and to tackle some of the issues that our Arab American community is dealing with, such as mental health and uh, substance abuse. Welcome to the show, and how are you tonight, Judge Mariam Bazze? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be here. I am doing well. I'm uh, doing very well this uh, this evening. Thank you. That's for great. <laughs> and I want to ask you, how uh, does it feel to be the second Arab American woman, woman appointed uh, to the bench in Wayne State, in Wayne uh, County? I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, it is, uh, it's is—it's an incredible feeling. I think that there's a huge sense of accomplishment, a huge sense of uh, honor in being selected for this role. And I strive every day to make sure that I'm, uh, I, I remind myself how grateful I am to be in this position. And so I, uh, it is certainly a pleasure and an honor to serve the citizens of Wayne County. Well, you are definitely waving uh, the way to so many women out there to dream and uh, to have their dream come true, for sure. I want to talk about uh, your work, and you uh, have served as an, uh, an assistant prosecutor uh, for 11 years in Wayne uh, prior to uh, being appointed uh, to be a judge uh, on the bench. So uh, tell us a little bit about your work. So I worked at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. When I first came out of law school, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. And a friend of mine convinced me to come and volunteer at the prosecutor's office. And I, I describe it, I fell in love with the practice mm -hmm. of criminal mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. um, when I was there, I, did, I worked in the district courts as well as the circuit courts. And I handled anything from uh, drug cases and gun cases and, uh, to uh, complex financial fraud cases and uh, some serious assault cases. And so that was, it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was a privilege to serve uh, in that role and help victims uh, of violence um, to certainly, I, I took my, what I did very seriously. It wasn't about winning a case, it was about bringing justice to the situation to the extent that I could. And yes. so that was very important to me. So I wanna ask you, like in recent uh, decades, the number of women uh, in the judiciary has significantly increased and uh, worldwide. So do you think that women are vastly underrepresented in top ranking judicial positions, including on high court uh, benches? I do. I think that the representation of women across the courts has, incre has increased, and I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I think our court is a great example of what that balance should look like. I think we have a real good balance of men and women on the Third Circuit Court. Yes. But there are many other courts that don't have that same type of balance. Um, and it's more difficult for women to get into judicial positions because, you know, in the past, this was very much looked at as a man's career and there were right. more barriers for women to succeed. Not that they weren't able to do the work uh, and they couldn't do the work, they're just, it just wasn't as easy of a path for them. I think we have a great um, Supreme Court, a great justice of our Supreme Court, Justice McCormick, and she has helped push initiatives um, relating to, uh, and basically she's talked about mm -hmm. uh, these types of issues and she's brought light uh, to this. and. Um, I think our court is great because it has a, a good representation of women on our Supreme Court. Uh, we have three women at this time of seven, of seven people. Um, but I do think there, there's a lot more to go when you look statistically across the state mm -hmm. and across the country. And I do think that balance it needs to be uh, shifted a little bit more to include more women. Okay, and do you think, or is it true that women are successful in getting into the field, but they, you know, progress slowly into like higher position or senior posts? Yes, I think that that is a problem across all industries. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, women are, they have to work harder to prove themselves, um, unfortunately. 
Uh, the good thing is with diversity and inclusion efforts, that is beginning to change. People mm -hmm. are uh, beginning to recognize the value of uh, all the different diverse segments of our community, including providing gender equity. Um, but when you look at particularly this type of field, there are limited positions of judges. You know, some communities, when you mm -hmm. look at the district courts, only have one judge. Mm -hmm. um, we have a large court, we have 58 judges, but there are some circuit courts that will have one judge for a number of, for a number of counties. Right. And yeah. so yeah. the ability to take that seat is just that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And because it's traditionally a man in those positions, it's a, a barrier that uh, it is just something that women have to get through before they can get to them. So in your opinion, why is it important to have female judges? I think it's important because we bring our own perspective to mm -hmm. the bench. We bring our own uh, way of seeing the world and viewing the world. I think ultimately the judge's job is to follow the law. Right. And it is, uh, it is the judge's um, job to make decisions based squarely in the law. However, um, it doesn't mean that there isn't an impactful way that you can bring your perspective in. So for instance, for sentencing, mm -hmm. when I am sentencing uh, somebody for uh, a crime, for instance, I can take my life experiences and see, you know, what have, what have I seen, what have I done, and uh, use those where I'm not just looking at the person as a person who's committed this crime, but what are all the dimensions of that person so I can fashion a sentence that is appropriate for them so that hopefully they never come back uh, through the criminal justice system again. So do you think that women are more compassionate when it comes to that or? You know, I can say that um, I think compassion is something that all judges should have. Okay, so, yeah. I think I, I, women, um, Without women, we would be losing a very important voice. Mm -hmm. It's just as important to have men than it is to have women. It's just as important to have women than men. I don't think anyone has more value. Okay. But I do think that if you don't have both voices at the table, you're losing a very important voice. Um, and it's also important because if we don't have women in judicial positions, then when our daughters look up, they don't think it's an option for them. Mm -hmm. And so when they don't think it's an option, we're losing talent, people who could come into those positions and do amazing things. But they, because they don't see somebody that looks like them in that role, mm -hmm. they might not think it's possible. And we as a society lose when that happens. So do female uh, judges d decide cases differently than male uh, judges? In a way. In a way. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I sit in my, and I only oversee my docket. I don't watch my, uh, my other, um, the other judges on the bench when they're doing their cases. Simply, I don't have time. But you have, I an, doubt but you have an have idea, time. I'm sure. You know, I would say that we, um, we decide cases in a way, at least I decide cases in a way that is reflective of my life experience. And my life experience is shaped uh, in part by my gender identity. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, it is important that um, I, I, well, first and foremost, I decide cases based on the law. Mm -hmm. But when given the opportunity to come up with programs for people, I am looking at that varied life experience that I have and hoping that I can provide somebody opportunities. And so, That's I hope. fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your advice for women who are interested in judicial careers? I think that it's possible. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't think that it was possible. But um, in, we're at a time where if you work hard, if you believe that you can do it, set goals. Mm -hmm. Set goals for yourself and um, talk to people reach out to people, have conversations with other judges, uh, women judges, male judges, talk to them and see, you know, how did they get there? What do, you, what do you think you need to do? Or what advice can they give you to try to get there themselves? I, I am the second uh, Arab American woman to serve on the Third Circuit Court. It was mm -hmm. very important to me when I went to the investiture of Charlene Elder, the first Arab American mm -hmm. woman to serve on the court, because what that meant is that that, that was another door that was opening. And so um, 
she has opened a door, I have opened doors. We've just had the appointment of Yvonne Abraham, uh, which mm -hmm. is, which oh, yeah, is that's wonderful. amazing, yes. And she is going to open doors for people as well. And I think that uh, this is, it's what we're doing um, is very important, but we're, we're making it easier for the next generation too. And hopefully they don't have to work uh, through as many boundaries as we might have had to work to yes, get here. Yes. But regardless, it's possible. And there are people here that will are, can support them and want to support them. Yes. This is what they want to so do. So how important it is to have a, a mentor during this time, you know? To me, it's been incredibly important. I think... Um, Especially in this field, I you, think. You can't do it in a vacuum. Yes. You, I, I had a lot of great mentors. I was uh, mm. previously... Uh, the president of APAC, and there, there was Osama Sablani, there was Abed Hamoud. They, they helped me through that yes. process. I had amazing women in my life: uh, Zain Al Hassan, Mona Fadlallah, uh, Fadwa Hamoud. All these people are amazing people in my life. Absolutely. Uh, at the courts, I had my supervisors. I, had, uh, you know, with the prosecutor's office, I had Kim Worthy. I, I, w when I look at mentors, I look at all the people who um, I have worked with. Uh, or I've had that relationship with that I can go to, I can talk to them and see, you but know, But it is your job to get. seek that uh, mentorship, I think. Uh, yes. Yes. It is, it is definitely your job to seek that mentorship. Right now, the chief um, judge of the circuit court is uh, Judge Timothy Kenny, mm -hmm. and he was a great mentor to me uh, when I was looking um, at this road. And so, but had I not gone to him and asked him for his advice and asked him, you know, what he thought, I would have lost that unique perspective exactly. that yes. he brought. So it's so very important. It uh, is very for important. Sure. I want to move on to the pandemic that has uh, affected our lives. Uh, to, I mean, we, it, it changed the way we think and live and work. And I want to ask you how this pandemic uh, impacted uh, your work as a judge. Um, so this pandemic has changed everything I knew about mm. how I was supposed to conduct my cases initially because the court was closed. I never thought that there could be an, a, a time when the courts would be closed to the public. But then we were in this scenario. It forced the courts to really fast forward maybe 10 years further than we were in technology. Um, it has meant that there are people that are in, unfortunately, in custody much longer, mm -hmm. trying to um, get their case heard. It used to be we had what we call the 90-day track. From mm -hmm. the time that your case came to the Third Circuit Court to the time that it went to trial, it shouldn't have been more than 90 days. Right. Well, now we have cases that are 180 days, you know, 360 days. It's, it's not a situation that we ever hope to see. And so... Um, it has impacted the way I look at bond. When mm. I'm releasing somebody pending a trial, I want to, I recognize that it's not fair to hold them. They're presumed innocent, so mm. they shouldn't be in custody uh, that time. I have to set a bond that ensures the community's safety um, and, uh, and flight risk. I want to make sure that they're going to appear in court, but also I need to be cognizant of, of that type of uh, and you probably had barriers. to learn quickly new things, right? Oh, yes, Zoom. Yes. I, Zoom was a huge change for us. Yes. Uh, having I'd like to know about that. <laughs> that has been very interesting. Um, we, we had a lot of hiccups in the beginning. Mm -hmm. but uh, Like we, any other business, for sure. Oh, it was, it was, exactly. We didn't know how to use it. We had to learn how to use it, make sure that the public had access to it, that our courtrooms yes. were open. Um, and being able, the way we called cases, everything changed, and we had to adapt. And we had to adapt very quickly to make sure that uh, the criminal courts just can't close. Yes. We have, yes. people have rights, things need to be heard. And so I think that we, uh, we've done it to the best of our ability in the most efficient manner as possible, and we're gonna continue to adapt. So what was the most challenging part of the adaptation to the norm, you know? What was the most challenging thing? I think uh, not being able, feeling like I haven't, I'm not as efficient. Uh, with, in the beginning, you mean? or So, like I said, cases were in a 90-day track. By the end of 90 days, they had gone to trial or pled guilty or mm -hmm. something had happened. And now it can be a year. 
before yes. anything happens yes. on a case. And so for me, I'm a person Did who you likes panic, for example, or? I did. I, I, I panicked because I wanted to get my work done, right. but I wasn't yeah. able to because of uh, the things that were related to COVID. And so that to me was very, uh, very difficult. And not having people in front of you and learning Zoom, people, reminding people turn on their mics, do you, you know, yes, connect yeah. to the system, things like that. It's been, it's been very challenging. Mm -hmm. But. So, uh, uh, can you walk us through the process of the c courtroom, uh, you know, so if during person, and then now after uh, COVID? So, before COVID, uh, people would just walk into your courtroom and they would be there and their attorney would come and your, their case would be called and they'd leave. Now, they just get on Zoom, they get a link, mm -hmm. they, they sit there. I, uh, I call their case, we do their hearing, whatever it is that we have to handle, that's all handled online. Mm -hmm. And then they're given their next date. Sometimes because of the way COVID is, you know, people are working, people are driving, people so are- So they can be uh, with you and they could be doing other things? Is that what you're saying or? <laughs> in a no, way, <laughs> they, they, so sometimes I have to remind I've, them. Because I, I heard stories. <laughs> I have to remind them they're still in court. I have to remind them that uh, they're still in court and they still have to appear and they have to go someplace quiet. But I'm also cognizant of, you know, there's no reason if their court appearance is going to take 10 minutes, right, why yeah. should they take a day off of work? So I'm okay if they're at work, but they have to step aside. So you were lenient somehow. I'm much more, I'll say this, I am much more lenient now. How do you feel about that? I'm okay with it. Okay. I think I'm okay with it. What's important is that when they're on the record, they're respecting the court. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I feel like this has been such a hard year. What we should learn, or we should, we all have to make decisions mm -hmm. on what is really important. And if a person um, is not dressed the most appropriate, you know, I might, uh, I'm going to, why aren't they dressed? I just, because they're at work, that's their work uniform. Okay. I'm, I'm, it was the norm. Yes, it's, it's different. It yes. used to be where they, they had to be dressed a certain way to come into court. And now mm. I'm much more lenient in the way I look at it. Okay. So uh, is it true that you can uh, actually be, a, you don't have to go to work anymore and just do it from anywhere? So a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I think so. Uh, in, in the criminal court, uh, I still go. I've, I've always gone to my chambers. But what You we have to or? I, I could work remotely if mm -hmm. I wanted. I choose to go into my chambers whenever I have a court hearing. Mm -hmm. But uh, what COVID has taught us is it's possible to work remotely. Okay. You don't have to be physically in court to get your cases heard and to have matters done. And it's and possible to get things done, for sure. Yes, and so while people might not be physically in the courthouse, it doesn't mean they're not working. Mm. I think the judges are working very hard at making sure that they're, ca they're handling their matters, they're calling their cases, and they're getting their work done. But until, but because the Supreme Court has said that we could work remotely, it's not necessary to be down there. And if it, everyone being down in, in, their, in the building increases a risk uh, to, for contracting COVID, because we know it has, isn't gone away yet. Right, but is it a decision that you make or it's your own decision or not? Well, right Can now, you be in Europe and, and, and decide a case? I don't, I don't think so. I think okay. we, we, you have to stay, you have to stay geographically within your county. Okay. Um, I would, uh, I would not do that. Um, <laughs> the Supreme Court has said you can work remotely, uh, your own courthouses. Uh, we're still developing exactly what that's going to look like mm. for Wayne County. Um, uh, I have chosen whenever I have a court hearing to go into my, uh, chambers, uh, and into my courtroom. It doesn't mean that I'm working any harder than anyone else. Everyone's working hard. They're just working. They're just figuring out what works for them while we are in this pandemic. Certainly there's going to be a post pandemic mm -hmm. and we're going to know what that looks like. But I'll say if they're, if they're home doesn't mean they're not working. It just means that they're working from home. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And how do you see the future of, uh, courtrooms? I think that, uh, the, this remote technology is here to stay. Okay. So this is increased accessibility. So think about it. Before, if you had to go to court uh, and you're a single mom, for instance, mm. you have to find childcare. You might have to find take an entire day off work. There's yes. a huge expense associated with it, and it's not it's not a pleasant experience. Um, 
And so this is giving people the opportunity to attend court and do what they have to do mm -hmm. at a minimal inconvenience to them. And so I think it will stay in uh, certain circumstances. And then there are certain circumstances that require you to be in court. Okay. So we, we're going to move on to the community and your work, basically, again. Um, you know, the greater Detroit area is uh, one of the oldest and largest and uh, probably most diverse Arab American uh, in, the, in the United States. And uh, like any other communities, uh, we have issues and problems. And uh, I think uh, one of the largest or one of the biggest crises that uh, our community is facing is mental health and uh, substance abuse. And since you serve in the um, um, uh, criminal uh, division, you oversee uh, the uh, uh, court or the uh, um, mental health court uh, uh, docket. Yes. So uh, w what can you tell us about, uh, about this issue or this crisis and how can we, uh, uh, you know, fix or how is it very challenging uh, this crisis to our community? So I think that uh, I, so I am one of the judges who oversees a mental health court docket. And what that means is for a period of a year, two years, three years, I follow a person who's pled guilty and, on, and mental health court probation and try to uh, help them uh, get the resource with resources to kind of break their addiction and find some mental health stability. Um, and what I would say is this is, um, this is a crisis. I think our community, uh, in particular is embarrassed by substance abuse issues and mental health issues. And uh, there is a stigma hmm. in if you, one of your family members uh, is using uh, drugs or has some mental health issues. And I wanna say a lot of times they're related. A lot of people will self-medicate with drugs. Uh, if they have, issue, if they mental, have issues. mental health issues. Okay. And so there's a stigma and because there's a stigma and families are so embarrassed by it, they don't go out and get the support that they need to help to help combat it. And what we need to do as a community is begin to erase that stigma. We need to talk about it. Uh, too many of our kids are dying mm -hmm. uh, uh, from both mental health as well as substance abuse. Um, when when your child has cancer, you no one no one says, well, why why does your child have cancer? They must be doing something wrong. This is a disease. Mental health is a disease. Substance abuse is a disease. Like any other health problem. Exactly. And what we need to do is start looking at it as a disease, talking about it, and coming together as a community to help supporting each other in trying to combat this disease. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we're able to do that, if we're able to erase the stigma and say, this is, it's, it's okay that you have this. What can I do to help you rather than say, you know, look at her son or daughter and this is what they were doing. So we need more understanding and more probably education when it comes to mental health and substance abuse, for sure. Definitely. We, we need a lot more. We in more programming um, and more support services, both um, in our community centers, at our mosques, at our, at our churches, wh whatever it is, we, we need more support. So do you think like one of the reasons that language barrier could be uh, a factor in, in this as well? I, I do think uh, language barrier is a factor. I think people, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, the support systems that have, um, there are places like Access, for instance, that have support uh, in it with translated in Arabic. There's LAHC. But, and again, those, they're yeah. probably ashamed of going to Access or uh, any other nonprofit organization that they know that they, these organizations help and help tremendously. They are. I think there is a shame in it. And mm. we need to mm. stop being ashamed. We need to find understanding. But it's, it's, it's important that we as friends, as family members, mm. tell you know, whoever it is, if it's my friend whose son is suffering or if it's my friend who's suffering, to provide that support yes. to them, mm. to help them find the resources so that they can combat these diseases. And it's hard. It is very hard. And I heard something that uh, the mistrust of mental health workers that they worry about. Uh, do, do, did you ever hear that? 
I think mental, I haven't heard that in particular, mm -hmm. but I can understand as a, as a community, we tend, um, some people tend to believe what they hear through rumor and mm. conjecture more than anything else. They're afraid if their son or daughter goes and sees a psychiatrist, they're going to change the way they think. Yes, I think it's, uh, what's it called? Like they don't, they don't want to be labeled, you mm. know? Yes, but the mental health providers are there to, just like a nurse is there to help you if Absolutely. you're sick, a doctor is yes. there. That's what, they're, that's what their job is. They're there to help you. And sometimes it's about uh, helping you get through a trauma. Sometimes you're child has been through a trauma that you might not be aware of. You right. might have been through a trauma that you don't recognize as a trauma. Um, and so sometimes it's, it's about talking about these traumas and figuring out ways to cope with them without relying on narcotics or things of, things of that nature. And I think the understanding that it's okay not to be okay sometimes, it is. Yes, so, I completely agree with that. I think yes. a lot of us during the pandemic had moments when we weren't okay. Absolutely, I agree with you. And I think we are going to take a little break and uh, we'll be right back with Judge Mariam Tazdik. <music> stuff okay. and your childhood. <laughs> Welcome to Hiya, and I'm still here with uh, Judge Mariam Bazdi. And I want to ask you, uh, you know, your story started when your parents uh, migrated from Lebanon to the U.S. in the 1970s, and this is uh, how everything started. So tell me about your childhood. Were you raised in, in Dearborn? Yes, I, so I was born in Dearborn. I was raised in Dearborn, so Dearborn is very much uh, in mm. my heart. It's, mm -hmm. it's part of why... I, I chose to stay here and be You're the here. first generation. Yes, I'm first generation. And we gr I grew up in a household that was struggling with that balance of are we, are we Arab, are we American, mm -hmm. are we going to go back to Lebanon, are we going to stay here? And that was a conversation through a lot of my youth. You know, I grew up, we grew up speak, uh, speaking Arablish. You know, uh, yeah. we spoke <laughs> Arabic and English and it would fuse together and Was make it very words. confusing to you? Did you have a struggle, you know, growing up with this? You know, I didn't because everyone else around me was like <laughs> okay. that. Everyone else was first generation. Okay. And so you, uh, you just understood each other. Um, and it was, that was a beautiful thing. That was a great way of, you know, not, I know people who emigrated to the U.S. but lived in communities that didn't have, uh, that didn't have the strong Arab American mm -hmm. presence. And they talk about feeling isolated, feeling lonely, being different. And so I was very lucky to be in this community because so it wasn't I didn't your case. have that. That was not the case. That wasn't the case. Okay, no. so you were one of the lucky ones. I, I do look at it like I was a lucky one, yes. Yes. So uh, what can you tell us about, you know, some of the challenges that you had to go through in climbing the ladder to get where you are today? I think first I had to recognize that it was possible to do it. Mm. I think, you know, growing up, there weren't as many uh, women in working, Arab American women that worked, that had jobs. And I, I just didn't think that that was possible. Mm. I thought that there was, um, that having a career was something that wasn't as important as having a family, having kids, things of that nature. And those are very important things. Mm -hmm. But some people, um, but I... You felt like it's a part of the culture? I thought it was part of the culture. That was, you know, culturally, that was the first priority. Mm -hmm. um, I think that has shifted now. Um, but I thankfully still had the support of my family and I, you know, and going to school mm -hmm. and getting mm -hmm. an education. And they were very supportive and 
uh, in my, all of my efforts in doing that. And so I think one of the biggest barriers initially is not even realizing that I could do it. Oh, okay. Um, and then eventually the, the barrier was progressing in a community that when I was coming up, there were a lot of people who were very supportive, but it was male dominated. And so people didn't take you as seriously. Um, and you had to work harder to be taking seriously, um, both you know in the community, but also in the profession. Hmm. Being a young woman in the profession, uh, I dealt with things that I'm sure other young women dealt with that men don't necessarily have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so those were um, some of the barriers that I had. Thankfully, I had an amazing family and uh, wonderful support. And my husband has been my rock my support throughout this process, my parents, my Did sisters, Did you get my uh, married before you finished school? I got married while I was in law school. Oh, my first, okay. And I had my daughter while I was in law oh, school. Okay, so it must have been harder it, uh, for you to do that. It was harder. And people say, how did you do it? And I say, when people put obstacles before you, you just yeah. go through them. Do you, you believe know? in balance? I, I do. I had to learn. It takes a very long time to find your balance, though. And mm -hmm. your balance at each point mm -hmm. in your career is different, too. There was a time where I focused a lot on my career and had to rebalance for my kids. Um, and so you have to find your personal balance uh, in life, but what the, the good amount of both that you are happy. Mm. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect balance, though. And I think as women, we have Just a lot delusional. of guilt. <laughs> we have a lot kind of guilt. Of. <laughs> we feel like we have to be perfect. Yeah. We have to and be we have to do it all, and we can do it all. <laughs> No, we can't. And I think one of the, um, it, it, when I realized I could order food and I didn't have to make dinner, that was a kind of sigh of relief because I tried to do everything for my family and have this career. And it, sometimes it got very stressful and it was very hard. Did you ever feel guilty? All the time. I still <laughs> feel guilty. We all do feel guilty. Yes. I, you know, we all feel guilty, but I think that's what we need to support each other more. I talked earlier about my mentors, and I think um, I have, and I know I, I didn't name everyone, I hope no one gets upset with me, but it was through talking to my family, those people in my life, mm. my friends, that helped me through those difficult times. And Your so big it's, supports. It's important obviously. to have a support system. So how do you see yourself contributing to the community? I think that um, I, I continue to do everything I can to help my community in mm -hmm. any way that I can. Mm -hmm. And re uh, currently I am working uh, with diversity and inclusion efforts with the court. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately has its impact on my community. Um, I, w I used to serve on the school board. Mm -hmm. And when I served on the board of education, I helped push plans that uh, would help our, our kids and because that's very important to mm -hmm. me. I think that if you're not invested in your community, then what are you invested in? Absolutely, I agree with you. And uh, I want to ask you something. Uh, Oprah says, there has never been a better time to be a woman. Do you have the same outlook and why? Yes, I think that this is the perfect time to be a woman because people are really, in the past we've had, um, a focus on gender, you know, they say pay equity, we need to hire more women. But what they're doing now is it mm. used to be when a woman went into a field, she almost had to be like the men to get on top. And what they're doing now is they're recognizing that women bring their, women just being women with their personalities, yes. with their more, comp with their compassionate side, with their even maternal instincts, that brings something to the table too. You don't have to be, um, as you don't have to fit the mold hmm. anymore. You can create the mold. And I think that we are very lucky to be living in this time because we are creating the mold. We are making change. Yes. And we are going to continue to make change. Very well said. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some words of wisdom that you like to share with girls that they might be still going to schools and universities? So I, I, I do believe anyone who wants this career, anyone who wants any career can do it. Don't be afraid to go for what you want. Don't be apologetic for asking people for help. Uh, people wanna help you, they wanna support you, and you just need to go out there and get it. Um, and help each other. 
I think that we as women will go so much further if we continue to support each other mm -hmm. and help each other uh, throughout our journeys. Perfect. I want to thank you so much uh, for being here on the show, on here show. And uh, what are your aspirations from here? I think right now my aspirations are to continue to balance. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm really enjoying Good what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing, but uh, for me, it's always been about service to the community. And so I will continue to serve, whether it's in this role or another role. Uh, but right now, I'm just focused on serving my community in the best way that I know how. And we salute you for that. And I want to thank, thank you. you so much again. And I want to thank uh, our viewers for watching. Thank you and have a good night.